All right, hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. Uh, so we've got the repairs on uh, all of the equipment I have uh, for the time that needs repairs. Those are, those are all done, so I figured this would be a good time for me to start on another project. And I figured I would take you guys along, uh, just show you some of, some of my build practices and um, how I go from, you know, taking a, a schematic or, or uh, you know, an idea for a circuit and putting it into a, um, a functional item. So, looking at here on the on the desk today, we have a um, this is a portion of the uh, the Heathkit AR15 uh, stereo receiver that uh, uh, we did uh, repair work to uh, about a year ago. And so, uh, the, the little back uh, story on this project is: uh, so my father asked me to build an uh, amplifier for his uh, television at his house. He wants to uh, play the uh, television audio through a set of speakers. And uh, he doesn't want to use uh, the AR-15, it's just in another room. So I figured, uh, well, maybe I'll just uh, build uh, him uh, the uh, amplifier portion of that AR-15 and put that to use for his television. So that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, so this is a, uh, a uh, uh, portion of the um, schematic for the uh, Heathkit AR-15. Uh, this is the uh, audio output uh, board here in particular, as we can see, Got the uh, the power amplifier. This is for the left channel. Of course, the left and right channels are identical. Uh, we've got all the major uh, components here. We've got our input coming in here. Our uh, pre-amplifier uh, transistors here. Our pre-driver, our driver transistors, and our output transistors. And uh, so I'm going to use this as uh, the basis for building this amp. We're going to build uh, uh, two channels. So uh, these two channels will be uh, essentially identical for a left and right uh, channel going to probably incorporate some sort of preamplification. Uh, I uh, haven't uh, got that portion laid out yet, but uh, that'll be uh, coming uh, hopefully in a uh, future video. As uh, we go along and build uh, this amplifier, uh, we'll put this uh, together. Uh, also some ideas we've got for this project. Um, he's asked me to put a, a speaker delay on the output uh, so that uh, you don't get the thump when the amplifier first turns on. So we'll do that. And uh, I've also uh, thought about putting in some sort of auto detection circuitry so that when he uh, turns on the TV, it will uh, turn the amplifier on automatically uh, when it detects an input signal going into the amplifier. So we'll look at uh, some ways to incorporate that as well. But uh, this first part here, we're gonna focus on taking this uh, schematic here that we see here and putting it onto a circuit board. And from there, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna go through uh, the, my process for uh, producing a printed circuit board. Uh, now, of course, there's uh, lots of ways uh, that uh, people make printed circuit boards from home. Uh, of course, you can always go with a mail order option if you've got, uh, you know, if you uh, have some time or you, uh, especially if you want to do uh, finer work uh, with surface mount and whatnot. Uh, in this case here, this, is, uh, this board at least will be all through hole components and I'm gonna use um, uh, my method I'd use at home to make uh, print circuit boards and so we'll go through that we'll go through that part in this video here uh, hopefully from uh, paper to a completed uh, printed circuit board so this is the uh, schematic as uh, Heath gets drawn it and then this is the schematic as uh, I've redrawn it to sort of get um, it's sort of laid out uh, at least in my mind a little more uh, logically so uh, we've got, to, and this is again, this is the identical schematic to the Heath kit. I haven't made any changes here. Uh, just simply rearranging some of the, the layout of the drawing. So we've got our input stages here, two transistors, and they've got a, a power supply from the uh, plus 27 volts coming in to power the uh, input stages. Next, we've got our pre-driver, which is down here. This is our, uh, our over, over, uh, overcurrent protection, so if uh, there's a, um, a fault on the output, this will limit the drive. And then we've got our uh, output section here, and this is, a, as you know, a quasi complementary repair. So we've got a, a, an NPN and a PNP uh, drive transistors, and we've got a dual NPN output transistors. You know, these diodes here simply are biased diodes for the um, driver transistors, and we know these are thermally attached to the heat sink of the output transistors to provide some thermal stabilization to keep these uh, transistors uh, biased correctly so that uh, we don't have any problems with um, 
thermal transients on the output transistors. Uh, from here we've got our input, uh, our high voltage input, which is at 83 volts, and we've got our output here, which our output is uh, capacitively coupled to the speakers, and go through an inductor here. So it's, it's it, when you sort of break it down, it's, it's a pretty uh, simple layout. Um, there are certainly more complex layouts for uh, audio power amplifiers, and there's a, a whole, uh, you know, uh, subculture of uh, of opinion and whatnot on when you uh, when you're building audio amplifiers. I like uh, I think this amplifier has a good sound. It's I've got a uh, Heathkit AR15 that I've restored also. I listen to it uh, you know on a daily basis, and it to me it has a very nice sound. So I'm going to use this as the basis for this project. All right, so we take our schematic here. We've got it uh, rearranged so that uh, it, it makes a little more logical sense. And we're gonna end up with a printed circuit board. So what I've done is uh, I got a copy here of the uh, Heathkit circuit board. This is from the Heathkit AR15 manual. This is just a uh, component side a pictorial of the audio output board, as we can see here. And I've gone and changed some of the numbering here to match the numbering that I'm going to use on my board, and we took the uh, took the layout, and it's essentially the same uh, layout as Heathkit used on their boards. I've uh, made a couple of uh, you know some uh, placement arrangements just to sort of straighten the layup up, make it a little bit uh, cleaner. Uh, when I build a circuit board, when I lay out a circuit board, I, I tend to like to keep things lined up. Um, I, I like to keep components that are similar size on similar axis. So, you know, it's where I've all of our half watt resistors here are going to be lined up. Um, of course they're lined up here and on a, uh, so line up this way as well. Uh, I like to try to keep components of similar size lined up on either a, a vertical or horizontal axis. And that's what we've done here. We've got uh, axial capacitors that we've used here and uh, our driver transistors here. And then this is our output section with our power resistors here on this side. These uh, large uh, black uh, dots here are simply the, um, the pads for the turrets I'm gonna use. I plan to make all the connections to this board with uh, turrets just to make it easier to uh, disconnect the um, wires going to the board or make connections as needed. You know, for some reason, I have to take this board out and service it or whatnot. It's it, to me, it's a cleaner approach than just uh, simply feeding a wire through a um, through a, uh, a circuit board pad. So that's what uh, you know. You see these large black dots here, and of course, our pre-driver transistors. Uh, you'll remember that uh, they are uh, these transistors here, which are mounted on the heat sink. So they're going to require a little bit of space. Now, when you do a board like this, you always want to make sure. Uh, when you uh, have your layout that you print it out to the to the size the actual size that's going to be so we can size up the components and make sure things like uh, you know our, our odd shaped components like these transistors are going to fit on in the uh, space you uh, you allow them for and you also want to keep in mind too that we're in any clearances for these pads these turrets that are coming out here so that they're not contacting things like these heat sinks so these heat sinks are electrically connected to the trans transistor body, which is the uh, collector of the transistor. So uh, when you're making these connections to uh, the circuit boards, the turrets and things, you wanna make sure you keep your turrets uh, with sufficient electrical clearance so you're not having uh, un uh, these uh, any short circuits there with your uh, connections. We also gotta keep in mind things uh, like uh, large size uh, components. We've got a couple of power resistors here. These are the um, uh, power resistors here used on the in the output section and you know they're going to mount here. So we want to make sure that these type components will fit in the spaces that are needed uh, that are allocated for them on the uh, circuit board. Uh, so in the same uh, same way we're going to do that with our capacitors too to make sure they fit uh, we've got uh, our transistors here again. They're lined up. These are these two transistors here, are just simple um, TO92 uh, black epoxy body transistors. This pre-driver here is a TO5 transistor, so it's going to look 
um, like this. It'll have a metal can and we'll make sure uh, that it's going to fit there with um, no, no, uh, no, no, um, no, no problems there with uh, the clearances. We've got uh, ceramic capacitors. Those have been sized also correctly. We've got one uh, a radial electrolytic. We'll put here. That's our input capacitor. All right, so here is our uh, circuit board traces, our layout here. Um, this is printed, I printed this on a sheet of vellum. Uh, you can get, uh, this is what I use for doing my, making my transparencies. And uh, the way I, you know, when I make circuit boards, I use a photo resist method. I think I've talked about that a little bit in some of the previous videos. Uh, there's a lot of uh, you out there that uh, will use a um, a toner transfer method. I know that's a really popular method. Uh, I do not use that method. I've never had much uh, luck with it. Um, so I've always just gone with the photo resist. I've been doing the photo resist for years. I have a lot of success with it. Um, it is, a, I think, a little more expensive to do it that way. But, um, you know, that's just uh, the way I've, I've done it. I've got the equipment already. I've had the equipment for years to do the photo uh, resist method. So that's what I use. So with a photo resist, um, you're not going to have a negative. You're going to use a positive. And this is what this is. This is a uh, positive um, pictorial here of our foil side. So when we make our circuit board, we'll take this uh, layout here, uh, which is just like this, and we will lay our circuit board on top of uh, this. Uh, align we'll line it up with the pattern here and lay it on top. And then the it will be exposed from the bottom using ultraviolet light, and the light will come through the openings, and the um, image will um, will prevent the ultraviolet light from ex from exposing any of the portion that's covered up by the by the uh, printout here. And when I do the uh, this method, uh, it works pretty good. I've, like I said, I use the vellum uh, because it's uh, readily available. You can print it uh, straight from a uh, uh, laser jet printer. I use this as a laser jet printer that I use to print these and it prints well well to the vellum. I, I've, I've in the past used um, overhead transparency sheets that are uh, you know they're clear almost uh, you know like glass but uh, printing to transparency tends to be a little more a little bit trickier and I found printing to the vellum that uh, you know it's almost like real paper you can tear this and uh, when you tear this it tears like real paper. And it's still plenty uh, translucent enough to get the image uh, onto the uh, printed circuit board. So here's a, an example of the type of board I'm going to use. And this is actually the board I'm going to use for uh, for uh, printing off this circuit board. This is a, um, it's a single-sided printed circuit board. I like to use the FR4 type. Um, as opposed to the uh, phenolic paper. I just, uh, again, I think it makes a better board. It's uh, certainly more durable. I use a three by four inch uh, board. That's the size of this board, and that's the size that I've uh, set this up for. So this is made for uh, putting on a three by four board. Something uh, that you need to keep in mind when you are uh, designing, a, laying out a print circuit board, uh, Keep in mind of the size boards that you plan to use. And then, of course, you'll have to uh, be able to get your design within the size constraints. As you can see, this is a, a very, um, it's, it's a fairly tightly packed board. It did take uh, a little bit of sort of uh, manipulating on uh, the computer to get uh, all the components aligned properly so that they would fit within the uh, three inch by four inch space and still give us uh, adequate uh, clearance for routing traces and whatnot. This is the uh, table we use. And what we'll do is, like I said, put the transparency here on the exposure uh, table and put the board on top of the transparency. And then we'll put this screen down and there's a vacuum pump that will, uh, this has a piece of, um, a piece of uh, plastic film there. And it'll vacuum down the board to the transparency to lock it, sort of lock it in place get a nice uh, tight um, seal on the board so that uh, we get a good exposure. And uh, we'll turn this unit on. I think uh, for these smaller boards, like uh, three to four inch boards, or three by four inch boards, I usually do about a, uh, maybe like 60 to 80 second exposure time. 
and the unit's got a uh, timer on it. It's already set up for the um, exposure time. All right, while the uh, board is going through the uh, exposure, go ahead and mix up our uh, development solution. I use the um, this uh, this uh, MG Chemicals uh, developer, and if you look on, uh, if it's on the back, yeah, the directions there will tell you what to do. Uh, you're going to dilute one part developer with 10 parts of water. And I've got uh, some, some glass beakers that I use to measure it out. And what I do is I just take, um, especially for these uh, smaller boards, I, I try to conserve the uh, the developer as much as I can. So I'll do, um, uh, I'll, I'll do uh, what I'll do is I'll take half, so I'll fill it to about 10 mls of developer, and I'll make a solution of... 100 mls of just i use a uh, warm tap water and uh you can use just a uh, cold cold water uh, i found it uh, it works a little bit faster uh if you use warm water but uh if you do use warm water you need to be uh ready to uh rinse it as soon as it gets developed because the warmer water will make it develop faster and you can overdevelop these and what will happen is is you'll the um image that's left behind on the board will be uh, faded out and it'll it will it won't etch very well when you put it in the etching it'll uh, allow some of the image that's supposed to remain to be etched so you will get uh, etching problems i use uh these trays these are uh, just pyrex dishes you can get them at um you know wherever you get uh, that sort of stuff grocery stores shop um you know different uh, shopping marks things like that uh, but when you do do this uh, as you can see this one's stained get yourself um a set of uh, dedicated Pyrex bowls. Don't use them for eating or cooking uh, when you do this because they'll get uh, stained here, as you can see. I use, I'll use i use this bowl for development. And once I'm done developing, I'll rinse it, dry it, and then use it for the etching. And you can see there's some uh, some etching stain right there. But uh, like I said, it doesn't uh, tend to bother things too much. I uh, use a smaller bowl. That way I'm having to use less uh, of everything having to use less developer and use less etchant, etchant uh, in here to get uh, the board submerged. I have a couple of uh, larger bowls here for uh, making larger larger boards and I have um, a small one too for making round it's a round bowl they're making very small boards but uh, I can't find it anyway. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get the uh, solution mixed up. I uh, will um, go ahead and expose the board. And because you're doing it, uh, the exposure is a photo etching process. So it's uh, just like uh, developing a photograph. You have to do the uh, light sensitive portion in the dark uh, because the uh, just ambient light, room light will uh, cause the... Um, pre-sensitized portion to start being exposed uh, so I won't be able to film that part it'll be uh, too dark but uh, I do that I do this portion in I've got a, a workroom off of the um, off of my office that uh, has no windows I can get it pretty dark all right so I've got the uh, room uh, pretty dark here and it's it's really this looks a lot brighter than uh, how it is in actuality uh, just because uh, the, the camera must be sensitive to that uh, that light there. But uh, I've got this little uh, snake light just sort of pointed up in the top of the um, top corner of the room, away from the exposure unit, which is, uh, which is down here, just to give me enough light so that I can get uh, this board, just enough light so I can get the board here, which is still in this um, uh, packaging. Uh, lined up onto the pattern and uh, get the unit closed up for the exposure. Now, of course, it's real important that uh, when you're uh, putting your board down here that you get it lined up uh, really good, especially in this case because I don't have a lot of uh, margin on the sides. I want to make sure I get a good alignment so that uh, all of the, uh, the image is put onto the board. All right, here's our board. Uh, now, what you see, the liquid that you see in there right now is just water. Uh, here is the uh, developer that's uh, already been uh, drained off. So, uh, you know, first thing I do once I pull the board out 
is I'll go ahead and get it in the developer and uh, start swishing it around. And again, if you have just, you know, just enough light so you can sort of see the, um, the image start developing, it'll, uh, it'll, it'll slowly come in. It's just like watching an old, uh, an old Polaroid picture start to develop. You'll see the image starting to come through, um, uh, here on the board and it'll start to come through and come through. And at that point is when I'll go ahead and turn the lights on because it's, um, once it's in, once it's actually in the developer, it's not going to be, uh, exposing anymore. And you want to, when you, in this part here, particularly, you want to be able to see, uh, your board really well, uh, so that you can see, you, you know, you have to sort of watch for the developer to come away. So we'll see, we've got, uh, two, uh, different, uh, colors going on here. There's this green and, uh, the gold, uh, copper. So you're looking for the, uh, the, the gold part, which is, uh, the copper, that's the exposed copper to, uh, be, uh, really, uh, really clear. And you want to, you know, just watch it as it uh, develops to make sure that you see when all of the, uh, this, uh, uh, on this board in particular, anyway, the, um, uh, it's that, that green color there. And that's, uh, the unexposed or the, um, portion of the board. So, uh, as you watch, uh, the, uh, the exposed side, the, uh, the, the resist will uh, rinse off of the board, leaving this uh, this copper color here. And uh, like I said, once you put it in the developer, the the image is going to be fixed on your board. And uh, we can see here that uh, this board looks uh, pretty good. Uh, it's a little looks like it was just a little bit longer than three inches. We can see uh, there's the edge of our board down there at the bottom. So that's that's not a problem. That's that's usually the way it comes with these, these boards. They're, they're not, uh, exactly, um, cut to the dimensions that specified. So we can just trim that off later on if uh, we want to, but, uh, this is what you're looking for. And then once you get a good image, um, like this on your board, you want to stop the, uh, development process. So if you just leave the board here laying in the developer, the developer will continue to, uh, develop the board and it'll, it'll slowly, um, uh, remove any of the uh, resist that's still left on the board and and, and you know you could uh, I, I, I guess eventually if you left it long enough it would just just leave the um, the copper there so you want to fix the image on the board and the way you do that is uh, you know pour off of pour off the developer and I just pour it back into the um, the little uh, beaker here that I use to mix the solution and then you want to use just regular cold water this is just cold tap water and submerge the board in that, and that cold water uh, will will fix the image on the board so that it's not uh, being developed anymore. And at that point, now this this board is developed, and the the resist is is quite um, it's 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 quite firm. Um, you know, you can rub your uh, your finger on, it and it's not going to uh, take the board off. Now, if I took a metal tool or something, scraped it, yeah, it would come off then. But uh, it's it's pretty good. You can you can take this board out, I'll take it out, and I'll dry it off. And uh, you know you can handle it. You can uh, sometimes I'll go ahead and drill uh, the holes out now before I etch it. Uh, but uh, usually I'll just go ahead and etch it first. But uh, you can you know take this out, and if you wanted to go ahead and drill out the holes now at this point before you go to etch the board. All right, so we've got our board, and I'm going to go ahead and etch this board now, and then I'll go back later, and um, we'll get rid of the uh, resist here. Um, and this is probably my least favorite part of making these boards, because uh, I etch with fer ferric chloride, and this stuff is nasty. Uh, so I've got a bottle here of ferric chloride, and this is, um, I have a very, I have a large, I think it's maybe like a two gallon bottle of um, ferric chloride and I, I use break it down into smaller batches because this stuff you can you can reuse this stuff um, you know for multiple times and I just put it in this bottle here and I'll put uh, a little bit in our bowl uh, which uh, is the same bowl that we used earlier this has been rinsed and dried after the uh, photo etching process and uh, I put a little bit in that bowl and I'll, I use it to etch the board. And when it gets done, I'll put it back into this bottle 
and reuse it again. And uh, so, uh, one thing to, uh, to keep in mind, at least uh, something I think about when I'm doing this. So, uh, you know, I reuse this and it's going to have uh, copper in here after it etches because uh, the chemical process uh, is basically, um, you know, it's, it's etching. So it dissolves the copper, the unexposed copper from this board and it's going to be in solution. So the copper will tend to settle out in this bottle. Uh, so you don't want to shake it because you don't, it'll stir up all of the, um, the particulate that's in this. So, uh, you know, it, it'll settle out and uh, I'll just pour it off the top and pour it back in here. And eventually this bottle will get to, it'll get to the point where when you etch a board, it's going to take a really long time and it's not going to be real. Um, it's not going to etch very good. And at that point, you'll know that uh, it's time to change the etching. So it's just one of those things that you sort of do from trial and error and you'll figure it out. But like I said, I get, um, you know, you can see this isn't, uh, it's not a huge bottle and just a little bit there. And I, I'll get, um, you know, quite a bit of use out of just this amount of ferric chloride. So this stuff goes a long way for me. Another uh, positive aspect of using the photo uh, resist as opposed to doing the um, total transfer is I can do the uh, these back planes. So when you do the the uh, photo etching, um, and when I make boards, I use a uh, back plane, a um, ground plane method, which is where you see here where all the ground connections are on uh, this common area that's left. So when I'm etching the board, I'm actually etching very little of the copper off this board. So that's gonna help with the longevity of the etchant. This bowl, uh, and I'll fill it to maybe, you know, maybe a quarter inch uh, deep or three eighths of an inch, just, just enough to get the board completely submerged. And I've got it sitting here on this heating pad and this gets quite warm. But uh, when you're doing the etching, I found that uh, when, I, when you heat the etchant a little bit, it will make the process go much faster. Now, if you look at the manual or the, um, the safety data sheet for ferric chloride, it'll tell you not to heat it above about 120, 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So you want to, you don't want to heat it too much, uh, because what'll happen is it'll start really, um, sort of, uh, off gassing and producing a lot of odor, uh, which is another part of this is you, when you do this, you'll want to do this in a well ventilated area because it does produce quite a bit of, um, odors and whatnot from the etching process so after i get this setup going here i'll cut the video off and turn the fan on because the fan's quite noisy and you don't want to listen to that but uh, anyway and i've got my thermometer here so i can sort of gauge the temperature and this is a again this is a process you've got a heating pad you've got a, a chemical which is uh, very reactive so you don't want to do leave this unattended this is something you have to sort of sit and babysit the whole time this process is going and you also are going to know when your board's done so i'll periodically uh, pick the board and you can sort of swish it around here and see and another thing too is because i'm using this this pyrex here that's clear uh, you can shine a light from underneath and you can look for the light uh, because when the copper starts getting etched away from your board you'll be able to see the light shining through this uh, board here because this is you know fiberglass so it's going to um allow some light to transfer through so that's one of the ways i use to gauge when a board is fully etched is i'll shine a light from the bottom here and i'll look at the traces and when they all look uh clean and i'm not seeing anything left on the sides i'll know hey the board's done etching at that point we can take it out and, and move on with the process and i'll see if i can sort of show you some of those um uh, some of that some of that here along the way all right, so go ahead and uh, got the uh, ferric chloride in the bowl here. And as you can see, that's about uh, how deep it is. And, um, you know, got the heater going. So we'll go ahead and put the board in now. And we'll sort of let it sit in there. And as we start getting the, uh, the solution over the top, it'll, it'll sort of sink down into the bottom here. So that board's in there now, and we can see that, uh, you know, it's fully submerged in there. And now this is going to sit for, you know, it takes maybe 15, 20 minutes or so to, to get it uh, good and etched. And, of course, that depends on uh, the temperature of your etching. So I'm going to heat it up a little bit, and that will help to speed up the etching process. All right, this board is... Uh, done etching so we'll take a look here I got this uh, flashlight so as you can see here 
Uh, you can do, this is how I determine whether it's done etching. Look here through the light, shine it through the bottom, and um, you, know, you sort of swish the uh, solution around. But you see that uh, the light there is shining through uh, the board there, and it's shining through the part that's been etched. And you can inspect the whole board, and that's what I'll do. I'll inspect the whole board, make sure that all of the traces, uh, all the pad holes and whatnot are, are fully etched, and there shouldn't be any... Uh, there shouldn't be anything left in the parts that are being etched. Uh, you want to make sure that's 100% uh, clean of all of the um, copper. And that's when you'll know that uh, the board is completed etching. Gone and, uh, you know, like I said, uh, we took the etchant that was left and just added it back into uh, my bottle there of etchant. And I'll, I'll use that etchant again and again until it uh, just stops, um, stops performing. But uh, done that, rinsed the board, and uh, rinsed the bowl out, and dried it off. So uh, we'll take this chance now. We'll just do a, uh, just a quick inspection on the board. It's really easy to inspect it now once uh, everything is cleaned and we can get it up and handle it again. And if you, you, know, you get to this point and you find that, uh, well, it didn't really uh, finish getting etched, you can still put uh, the board back in and uh, put it back in and etch it some more. But uh, this looks like a pretty good, uh, looks like it etched pretty good. And uh, as you can see there, you can see the um, the pattern through the uh, trace. But, uh, you know, this is our component side here. And you can see how, um, what I meant, uh, how it was not a negative. So if you remember that uh, drawing there, that's what uh, that drawing looked like. That's what we laid it down on the foil side straight onto the pattern. So now we need to... Uh, again, you know, you could take this time now and drill out the holes if you want. I'm going to go ahead and completely uh, finish this board, and then I will drill out the holes so that the, the last thing I'll do is drill and then mount components. So the next step then is going to be getting the uh, resist off of the board. And I found um, the way I use is I just use some isopropanol alcohol. And we'll just use, uh, you know, this is just rubbing alcohol that... Uh, you can get uh, anywhere and uh yeah for a while there with uh, the covid it was kind of hard to find this stuff but uh you know the stores back having it now and i'll use uh either 70 percent or i'll use the um uh, i think it's uh it's like 90 percent or whatever uh, whatever i can find um you know this is just plain isopropyl alcohol it's not scented or anything and i'll go ahead and put uh, some in here now and what i'll do is again just Pour enough in here so that, uh, you know, it covers our board and I'll let it sit for a minute and it'll start to, when you do this, you'll see that uh, it'll start to sort of the water or the um, alcohol in here will start to turn a little bit blue and that's when you know that uh, the resist is starting to work its way off. And then once I see that, I'll get a um, uh, one of those like little greeny scouring pads and you can uh, scour, uh, rub off all of the resist to the all you're left with is just the uh the copper at the end all right here's our board it's all cleaned off now as you can see uh just uh scoured it there with um just use one of these greeny pads and just cut uh you know just a little piece off so that uh, we didn't have to use the whole piece and uh it cleans off pretty well if you let it soak for just a minute or so in the isopropanol it'll really work the resist loose and then it's uh, you just really rub it off and make sure that uh, you get all of um, the uh, resist off there. Uh, so the, the, what I use to tin the board is this uh, this stuff here is against the MG Chemicals. It's liquid tin, and it's really the only uh, tinning product that I've found uh, that uh, you can buy. And this stuff is is really uh, quite expensive. I, they ought to call it liquid gold because it's just really expensive for these bottles here. So again, just enough to sub get the board completely submerged. And as you can see, the tinning process has already started to take effect. It's got that uh, silver color to it. And you'll let this sit, you know, for a few minutes, just, you know, get it uh, good and uh, worked in. And then once you're done here, we will uh, drain off and rinse the board and dry it off. So the only thing left to do here now on this board is to drill out the holes. So we'll drill the holes out and then we'll do a... Um, I'll always do a, a continuity check on all these traces just to make sure that they're all complete um, and we don't have any uh, broken traces. Got a uh, little drill press and that's set up right here. 
So this is a this is a small drill press. It's a, I guess it's like a modeling drill press. Uh, I don't know. I got it a couple years ago from a model uh, uh, one website that sells things, tools for doing like model railroading and uh, like model airplanes and stuff. They had these drill drill presses, and I got some uh, some drill bits. These are I think these are repurposed drill bits from um, like uh, the industrial. Um, I don't know what you call them, the automated uh, drill tables. And they've got uh, the sizes here for uh, the drill bits. And uh, there's two different sizes um, uh, for the drill bits. And those are the ones I use. That's, uh, that's where I got them from uh, on eBay years ago. I have no idea if uh, the bit guy is still selling drill bits on eBay. But uh, anyway, I, you know, you can probably find these. I'm sure the... Uh, these can still be purchased. These are, uh, like I said, the small drill bits. And I'll use these to uh, drill out the holes on the PCB. I use a, um, have one of these, uh, these, go these little uh, gooseneck lights here uh, just to make some, put some light there on the, uh, on the uh, circuit board. So while I'm drilling, uh, I, can, I can line up the bit with the hole so that I make sure that I can get the... Um, the drill bit centered in the hole uh, to get a nice uh, straight, uh, you know, centered hole drilled in the in the pad there, so that we get the most amount of, of uh, the copper on each side. Uh, we've got our board populated now, and uh, you may be wondering why there's uh, two boards here, and I'll explain. So some of you who uh, are keen observers may have noticed this. Uh, there's one. Uh, major defect that I noted on this board. So this is the original board in the uh, uh, demonstration there uh, before about how to actually etch the boards. And this is the actual board that is going to be used. And if you'll, uh, I'll show you the uh, the uh, error here. So if you notice that uh, this transistor up here is uh, has a trace routed to the heat sink. Well, that's fine for this one down here because this is the collector pin for this transistor and the heat signal in the collector but up here on the top this is the emitter pin and this is the collector so when I was uh, routing the traces um, I uh, just routed this uh, for whatever reason thinking it was the same as down here and it's not so it effectively short of the collector and emitter of this transistor together so that's not going to work and uh, I don't know I've already uh, made this board and, and I you know you could you cut the traces and run some uh, uh, a, a wire to rejoin these traces and I, I may do that but uh, anyway uh, so the, uh, my um, perfectionist side wants to just make a new board so that's what we did here got a new board and so it's kind of uh, you know it's funny sometimes you don't see things I didn't catch that mistake until I was going back and reviewing the video and I noticed that on the video so uh, anyway there we have it sometimes those things just happen but uh, other than that, uh, the board turned out really good. It's a nice, uh, it's a nice board. It's nice and compact. Uh, we had plenty of clearances for our uh, turrets here to our heat sinks. And so when you do a board like this, when you make a board, it's always good to go back and check your work. Um, you know, it's always good. Uh, you can uh, check it with the schematic, make sure all your connections um, are proper. And a lot of the um, uh, software that uh, that uh, you use to uh, lay out circuit circuit boards, uh, you know, you'll it'll take the information from the schematic and it'll um, you know tell you when you place a component down where to connect the uh, traces between the pins. So you always go back and double check those uh, connections and you know do a um, you know you just a lot of times I just do a sanity check. So I'll just compare. Uh, the schematic to the board layout just to make sure outside of the software to make sure that all of the connections look to be correct and this particular mistake was made um, again here in the, in the software I made this connection uh, without the um, the, uh, the layout program telling me to make the connection uh, because I didn't uh, identify these heatsink pins as actual uh, component uh, pins so they weren't uh, going to connect to anything uh, one more good check too is always look for solder bridges. Uh, the way I do this uh, when I'm looking at my boards is again with the uh, flashlight. I'll uh, sh just shine a light through the board 
and again just like we did with the etchant looking uh, at the light through the board to make sure that uh, we don't have any uh, solder bridges uh, you know with these especially with these tight clearances uh, it, it can happen uh, sometimes you see it when you're making the connection but uh, sometimes you don't and so it's always good to go back and look uh, through your uh, all your solder connections and make sure that there's no bridges there now when you're laying out a board you always want to think about uh, how you're planning on mounting your board to uh, whatever you know in enclosure that you want to put your project in and as you can see what we did here is when I was laying out the board and laying out the ground plane that we added um, well, we included rather isolated areas on the ground plane for mounting these standoffs so these standoffs are mounted here and as you can see the uh, ground plane has been etched around them to leave nothing but uh, blank board there and that's so that these standoffs are electrically isolated from this ground plane so I don't want to make a, an electrical connection between the ground plane on this board and the chassis that I'm going to mount it to. So simply just etch the area out around these standoffs. Now, you know, for whatever project you're wanting to put together, you may, you may want to do that. In this case, I didn't. But again, it's just something to think about when you're laying out a board is, uh, you know, a lot of times when you get, uh, we get uh, fixated on the component placement and where we're gonna put all these components and we may not think about things like this and sometimes these may be an afterthought. In this case, with this board here, as uh, heavily populated as it is, it's uh, really kind of played into, um, it took a little bit of planning as far as the layout to try to figure out where to put uh, these mounting holes. You know, typically I'll put them in the corners, um, but uh, you know, that, that obviously in this case didn't work uh, because we were using all of the board space, all the edges here for these turrets. So, Again, something to think about when you're laying out your board um, is how you're going to mount the board and where you're gonna put uh, your mounting hardware. So this is going to wrap up this video. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed the video. You were able to learn uh, some something about the methods that I use to uh, make printed circuit boards. Like I said, these methods are uh, good for doing photo etching. And uh, it's a method that's worked really well for me in the past. I've had a lot of success with it. And it's like any uh, anything else you do, you know, the more times you do it and you learn uh, how to how to make efficiencies, how to do things so that uh, you get consistent results. Uh, you know, when I first started making boards like this, I uh, usually would take uh, maybe two or three runs to get that board that was actually usable, uh, either, either not uh, overexposed or that etched properly. So it's just one of the things you have to learn to do. And as you do it more, you get uh, better at it. Um, you know, we had the mistake with the board earlier and, uh, even still, I didn't see a reason to do any reshoot any of the, uh, previous v video sections. You know, there, that, uh, the etching portion was still, uh, applicable to, uh, how to go about making these boards. So we didn't, uh, I didn't bother to reshoot those, but anyway, uh, again, it's just something to, uh, keep in mind, uh, hopefully a lesson that uh, you can take with, uh, your builds. Uh, if you like the video, stick around. There will be uh, hopefully more to come from this series. Uh, I plan on doing a, um, a build series on this project, uh, kind of hitting the highlights of, of uh, some of the uh, points along the way. Uh, I'm not uh, exactly sure what the, uh, what the uh, flow path as far as the videos will be. I've got uh, a general idea of how I'm going to go about building this project, so we'll see how that goes along the way. But, uh, you know, s stay around and... Uh, there'll be uh, more to come. Thanks for watching the video and that's all for this episode.